This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. The Law Society of Upper Canada versus CCH Canadian Limited et al. R. Scott Jolliffe, L.A. Kelly Gill, Kevin Sartino, Sartorio, pardon me, for the appellant, Kevin L. LaRoche, for the Intervenor Federation of Law Societies of Canada, Roger T. Hughes, QC, and Glenn A. Bloom for the respondents, Thomas G. Heinzman, QC, and Barry B. Sukman for the Intervenors Canadian Publishers Council and Association of Canadian Publishers, Claude Brunet, uh, Benoit Clermont, Claude Brunet, Benoît Clermont, and Madeleine lamotte sanson for the Intervenors, Société Québécoise de Gestion Collective des Droits de Reproduction, and Access Copyright. On March 4th, 2004, exactly 20 years to the day from when this podcast episode drops, the Supreme Court of Canada released its ruling in CCH Canadian versus Law Society of Upper Canada, a decision that stands as perhaps the most consequential in Canadian copyright law history. As you heard then-Chief Justice McLaughlin name off the all-star list of lawyers who argued the case, few that day might have anticipated that the case would firmly establish fair dealing as a user's right and serve as the foundation for copyright law in Canada for decades to come. Leading off that day for the Law Society was Scott Jolliffe, an IP litigator with the law firm Gowlings, who had played a lead role in a decade-long battle between legal publishers and the governing body of lawyers in Ontario. Jolliffe was charged with arguing the fair dealing aspects of the case, but it was only at the last moment that users' rights entered the picture. To mark its 20th anniversary, Jolliffe joins me on the podcast to talk about the CCH case, his strategy and insights from the hearing, and his thoughts on its impact many years later. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Michael. And I must say, it's really a pleasure to do this with you. Okay. I'm so glad that, that you've chosen to to come on and do this. I think it's going to be just great. I'm, I've been excited about this for ever since we, we arranged this. So uh, as you know, and, and, and our listeners will now know, um, this podcast is going to drop on the 20th anniversary of the Supreme Court's CCH copyright decision, which is it's obviously notable and, and worth marking because it's widely regarded as, as perhaps the most consequential copyright decision, certainly in decades and, and arguably even ever in Canada, if, if we look through the development of copyright through the courts in Canada. I, obviously, I want to canvas your involvement in the case, uh, recollection of both the case and the hearing, and think a little bit about the impact as we look back now t- with 20 years of hindsight. But why don't we start first, for those that uh, don't know Scott Jolliffe, a little bit about your career. You recently uh, retired from Gallings. Can you talk a, a little bit about uh, your path and, and your legal career. Sure. Well, thanks, Michael. And uh, so you're not going to believe this, uh, but I started at Gallants as a summer student in 1975. Um, and I guess I was fortunate enough to have Gordon Henderson as my mentor at the time. And Gordon had talked when I was in high school, had talked me into taking engineering and then law and then joining his firm in intellectual property. And of course, I followed that advice uh, mainly because I had so much respect for him. Um, I was very fortunate to have worked on some really, what I see (laughs) as important uh, intellectual property cases like the CCH case um, and a number of other ones, maybe for another podcast, but the uh, Orkin and Pesco trademark case uh, goes back to the 1980s when uh, we convinced the court to break away from UK law uh, uh, to protect the goodwill of foreign trademark owners, uh, even though they had never used their trademark in Canada. So a a real precedent setting case. Uh, You may be interested to hear that uh, that case and, and the CCH case were both against my good friend, Ron Dimmick. Um, an icon in the intellectual property area. But I'm happy to say that um, that I won both cases, uh, as I always point out to him. But uh, 
to be perfectly frank, uh, he probably won all of the other cases that we had together. Um, so in terms of my career, I got a little distracted in 1995 when I was elected to uh, met the managing partner position at Gowling's. But uh, I was determined to maintain my practice. And at that time, pretty well the same time, I got involved in the CCH and Law Society case. So, uh, and I should also say, in terms of my good luck, uh, it was to have worked with great lawyers like Kelly Gill, uh, who was on the Law Society case, uh, and uh, Kevin Sartorio. Uh, we, we, the three of us handled the trial together. And uh, of course, they have now survived me. I retired from Gowling's at the end of uh, last year. Um, now wondering what to do with the rest of my life, other than uh, joining podcasts with people like you. All right. Well, I'm glad you've taken some time to to join me on the pod to to engage in those recollections. Uh, you mentioned when you first started getting involved, the, the that CCH case ran for for more than a decade as a legal dispute. I think it started back in 1993 as a dispute between the Law Society of uh, of Upper Canada, Law Society in Ontario, and and the legal publishers publishers objecting to copying that was taking place by the Law Society. Can you, or under the auspices, I suppose, of the Law Society, can you describe a little bit their concerns and and the Law Society's response that ultimately led to this decade-long legal dispute? Sure. Well, I probably shouldn't speak for the publishers, um, but just to give you a little more background, uh, for over 30 years, uh, lawyers had been uh, copying case reports for research and uh, and for use in court. So the question really is why why now or why then uh, did they uh, choose to bring the lawsuit? And I can only uh, guess that it was because they saw the uh, licensing of uh, their publications uh, to lawyers and law firms as being a, a lucrative market and an additional source of revenue. Um, of course, an interesting point is that the real market uh, would have been the lawyers and the law firms. Um, and it kind of made me wonder why they brought this case against the Law Society. I thought, frankly, that was a tactical mistake on their part for reasons which uh, we can get into. Uh, but, the, you know, the Law Society uh, was in a much better position to make a, a strong uh, public interest, less commercial argument, not to mention having the motive and resources to want to fight the case. Um, so I wasn't the first counsel uh, for the Law Society in the case. Uh, defense had been drafted, and I was asked for essentially a second opinion on the defense and on the merits of the case. Um, the Law Society was very concerned about lawyers having to pay license fees for what they had been doing as part of their daily research and uh, lawyering. Uh, I remember the treasurer telling me that it was absurd. It was like putting a tax on lawyers on the profession for <laughs> doing exactly what they've been doing for many years. Um, so my view uh, on the Law Society's uh, case uh, was uh, really contrary to the uh, previous counsel. Uh, I did not think that this was a standard textbook copyright case. Um, and if that was the approach they were to take, they would likely lose the case. I mean, the Law Society was effectively selling photocopies of copyrighted works and uh, renting their machines for others to use to make copies without any real control to ensure that what was uh, being copied, how much was being copied, for what purpose. Um, so my view to them was that uh, uh, they would not be successful if the standard approach was taken. And that the case was essentially a public policy case uh, and it had to be fought on that basis. Um, the uh, My view was the Law Society had to take the high road in terms of the importance of legal research uh, and, uh, and also on the role that the Law Society played in terms of providing access to the law. And of course, finally, and the, the, this uh, may seem hard to believe, back in 1993 or four when I was retained, 
uh, I told the Law Society that the case was likely to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. And if they were going to be serious about the case, they had to understand that. So uh, my first recommendation uh, to the Law Society was to create uh, an access to law policy that governed sort of when and how and uh, how much copying would be permitted under their auspices. Uh, of course, <laughs> you, uh, you've now read the the policy and the decision, and, and I have to say, admit that it was self-serving, and talked about the importance of uh, the or the public rationale for providing this service uh, to the profession. But it's interesting, you know, having reread the decision, how important that access to law policy, as I drafted it. Um, and the fairness of the law society's practice uh, has become the had become the cornerstone of the case, at least in the Supreme Court. And uh, all of our evidence at trial, I don't know if you have access to the witnesses that were called, but they were essentially judges and professors and practitioners and librarians reinforcing the importance of this access to law policy. So that's probably more than you wanted to hear, but that's the background uh, of the case. No, that gets us off to a great start, I think. Um, so so it starts in the federal court, and as you, I guess, rightly predicted or warned, it ultimately goes to the federal court of appeal and then ultimately the Supreme Court of Canada. I, you know, as the case gets to the Supreme Court, when, when I teach the decision, and, and you mentioned the potential strategic blunder, and perhaps it's a good opportunity to bring that in, you know, there's two things that strike me. Uh, in addition to the fact that the, when you look at the list of the lawyers that argued the case that day, yourself and Gill and uh, Roger Hughes and Heinzman and Barry Sookman and Brunet, among others, I mean, this truly was the the leaders in the, the profession. But there are really a couple of things that, that strike me. First, that this involved a dispute over legal materials, largely, certainly over textbooks, but judgments, of course, being being an important part of that. And, and in some ways, amounts to publishers telling the authors of those judgments, the judges, that they've got the ability to restrict others to who make copies of those works. And, you know, I think in hindsight, you, you sort of, you think about that kind of argument and it's a, a pretty tough argument to make to judges, especially when you're talking about the actual text. So, you know, you led on the fair dealing arguments and we'll come back to that in a minute, but can you talk a bit about that sort of the strategic choice in a sense, almost of facts and who they, they took on in this case, because this isn't dealing with just any sort of materials. This is dealing with the materials in some way the judges themselves have have written, and presumably they've done so uh, out of thinking that they're doing so for the public interest, not out of a, a desire to profit from it. Yes, well, let me go back to the strategy of the case for a minute. So there were many issues uh, that seemed seem in hindsight to have been losers. Uh, but um, the uh, we strategically, we decided we did need to uh, raise some issues that were uh, uh, that would point out the weaknesses of the publisher's position. Uh, so, for example, challenging the existence of copyright in the case uh, may seem odd because the standard at the time, the sweat of the brow standard, was uh, a pretty weak threshold. But, but what it really did is it brought out exactly what the materials were that were being copied and, and why. So essentially, uh, the judicial uh, reasons, uh, which are essential to the, uh, uh, our common law system. Uh, and by putting some focus on that issue as an example, really brought out the, uh, the importance of why people were copying them. And, uh, and even though it was essentially a loser, even with the modified originality test that the Supreme Court of Canada adopted, uh, it did focus on the subject matter of the copying and the purpose for it. So, and other issues that we raised, like uh, uh, taking a, an insubstantial part of the work, uh, also highlighted the importance of, of what uh, people were copying work for. And that was really the judicial decision. Uh, 
So it wasn't uh, just about fair dealing that uh, that we uh, used to develop our strategy. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning, we knew that ultimately the uh, it was the court's approach to fair dealing uh, uh, that would either win or lose the day for the law society. You mentioned that that going specifically after the law society you thought was a was potentially a strategic blunder. Um, you know how so? Well, you know, lawyers and law firms are uh, making their living, <laughs> a essentially a, a commercial undertaking uh, that uh, uh, has them uh, copying cases and charging clients for them, uh, and. Uh, my, I, I, from the very beginning, I wondered why did they decide not to pursue, you know, one or two or more law firms and pursue the Law Society, which is a public institution that has uh, no motivation other than uh, providing access to law and, and good lawyering. Uh, so I do think that was a, a, a strategic uh, mistake on their part. Okay, interesting. Now, there, there's the facts of the case, and then there's, of course, the the evolving view of copyright at the Supreme Court. And you know, one of the other things that the other big thing I think that strikes me about this case is how soon it came after the Tay Bears case, which was a, a four three four three split decision. It contained some notable language from Justice Binney about the public domain and the limits of, of copyright. I recall when that decision came out, it involved a, an art gallery, that there were some who downplayed the decision. They thought, no, it's it's split. It's narrow, narrowly focused on this specific issue. Although I know certainly to me and I suppose to some others, it, it looked like a, 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 the cra a crack had been opened in terms of a bigger change within Canadian copyright. Uh, as I was rereading the transcript of your arguments, you quoted Binney's language directly back to him. Um, can you talk about uh, you know the role they bears played and and sort of the strategic decision to 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 bring it up in the case? Sure. And and Michael, let me just uh, back up a little bit because uh, the Tiberius decision uh, came out in two thousand and two. Uh, I think after the Federal Court of Appeal uh, uh, case was uh, maybe not decided, but at least argued. Uh, so, so going back to the beginning, we didn't have Tabers, uh, which you know, in the Supreme Court of Canada, became a cornerstone of of the argument. Uh, but let me deal with your question specifically. Uh, by the time we got to the Supreme Court of Canada, Tabers, uh, the Tabers decision existed, uh, but it was a controversial decision. As, as you will recall, the decision was a split decision, four to three. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, you got to wonder <laughs> which of the judges on the bench are going to uh, embrace the outcome in Tay Bears. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, that was the first time that the Supreme Court of Canada had recognized the need to balance the various rates under the Copyright Act. Uh, it, it's a case that could have been distinguished quite easily. I don't think CCH did that, but but uh, by limiting it to its special uh, facts, it wasn't a fair dealing case. It was really about uh, copying, uh, or sorry, not copying, but uh, transforming uh, an existing work to a new, uh, different substrate. So, so... The, on the facts, it was a very different case from the Law Society case, and it was not about uh, fair dealing. And it's interesting how those wonderful words of Justice uh, Binney about balancing uh, the public policy uh, rights under the Act um, uh, came out of that, that case on that fact basis. Uh, w the Law Society case from the beginning was all about uh, interpreting the fair dealing uh, provisions of the Copyright Act. Uh, and you'll recall that the case law up until Tabers wasn't about balancing rights. It was all about uh, strictly construing and limiting the application 
of fair dealing, which was considered to be a, uh, a right uh, or a, a public right under the Act. It was considered to be a limited right, but provision which exempted infringement in specific circumstances. So the Bishop and Stevens case uh, was all about limiting the scope of that right. Um, so, so anyway, the the uh, adoption of users' rights writ large uh, was also farther than we needed to go to succeed in the Law Society case. We, our goal was to have a, a, a more meaningful uh, interpretation of fair dealing as a public right, uh, which uh, which was essential to the balancing of, of rights under the Act. But anyway, you, you mentioned uh, my oral argument. It, uh, right out of the gate, Justice Binney, uh, I, I had hardly got uh, 30 minutes, or maybe 20 lines out of my, uh, or 30 seconds into my argument when he asked me about the case, uh, which uh, I thought, oh, this is a terrific opportunity. And uh, so, so I, uh, right from the beginning, I figured we did have an opening to not just uh, uh, talk about the public's right of fair dealing, but talk about the balancing of, of users' rights against uh, copyright owners. Uh, but uh, I was also anxious because of my concerns about the case that we not overstate the importance of that approach in order to succeed in the case. Um, I didn't want a user's rights to become the cornerstone uh, of uh, either winning or losing the case when we didn't need to go that far. That's interesting because, of course, the, the case is now, I think, really best known for its language on yeah. user rights. You know, it, it wasn't a focal point for you, and you've, you've explained why in some of the opening, but you did use your reply to raise it, and you specifically uh, referenced Professor Vaver, who uh, is credited and, and cited in the decision, uh, referencing user rights. So, so was that the plan? Was it something that was a bit more uh, spontaneous? It, it's quite clearly had had a dramatic effect on changing copyright discourse in Canada now for decades. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the oral argument, it really was spontaneous because I just wasn't sure how. Uh, the court, that bench, which was close to the same bench as in T. Parish, was going to uh, embrace uh, users' rights. So I talked about public rights under the fair dealing uh, section, but I did not talk about users' rights, as you say, to the very end. And only after having got the sense from the bench from all of their questions and interest uh, in users' rights uh, that I really went full out. You know, looking back in the transcript, it's incredible to see how that that one paragraph has had such an impact. Uh, so the hearing takes place in, in November. Decision comes reasonably quickly in, uh, on March the, the 4th, uh, 2004. It's far from that 4-3 decision in Thay Bears. This one's a, a unanimous slam dunk winner. You know, walking out of, of the hearing that day, is is that what you expected? Um, did it exceed, mm -hmm. did the decision ultimately exceed expectations? You know, what, what did you think you were going to get and how did it compare to what you actually got? Well, Having gone through uh, two lower court uh, decisions where the uh, courts uh, decided uh, uh, on balance the issues against us, <laughs> I, I, uh, my expectations going into the case were, uh, were muted, <laughs> uh, as any uh, good litigator has to do. You've always got to be prepared to take a loss. Uh, but... Going into the court, uh, it was obvious to me that uh, the, the judges were very interested, very engaged. Uh, they obviously had before them the, the earlier cases, which had canvassed thoroughly all of the issues. Uh, they had their Tabers decision uh, in the background of their minds. Uh, and uh, it was clear to me that all of them had read the materials, 
and were very interested in the case. And, and I, I must say that uh, they also came to a case that they know a lot about in the sense of how reported decisions are used for research, for study, and for presentation to the court. And, uh, you know, many of those uh, decisions, uh, uh, or at least that process, they had been involved in themselves. So they're very familiar with it. So I left the courtroom with a, a positive feeling about the reaction that I was getting from the judges who were all paying attention, had all read the materials, and virtually all of them were engaged in a discussion during the course of oral arguments. Okay, and, and on decision day, when you when you got the decision, did uh, you had a muted expectation going in? Uh, did this go <laughs> even further than, than you might have uh, hoped or dreamed of? Well, you know, I, I would be uh, not be totally honest if I said that it didn't exceed my expectations, if not all of them. And, uh, and I think uh, you had mentioned this uh, report from a, from a reporter in the Globe and Mail who interviewed both of us, I might say, after the case. Uh, and in my response, uh, I, I guess I was not hesitant about uh, the positive feelings I had about the outcome of the case, not only for for lawyers, but for educators, for students, for reporters, whether their use was seen to be a commercial use uh, or uh, uh, a use that might otherwise have been licensed. So I was thrilled. I was thrilled uh, for us, for the Law Society, and quite frankly, for Canada, because I think in my heart of hearts, I believe that this is the uh, appropriate decision to see fair dealing as being a uh, a public right that uh, that forms no part of the ownership rights of, of copyright owners. Yeah, I know. You're right. You mentioned that, that Globe and Mail decision. We both got quoted. I, I... I, I think I said, I can take a look at it. I, I called it the most important copyright law uh, decision we've had in Canada in years. And you, as as you, you've just done, really emphasized how this applied so broadly to journalists. I think you mentioned economists, students, kids doing research that uh, this was, and, and your closing quote there was, the court is balancing a decision in favor of users' rights as opposed to creators' rights. Uh, and so you, I, I think you saw that right away. What's your thought on on how, the bar, how other users, how the community as a whole responded to the decision, because certainly um, there were some that said this this is a sea change. This has really changed the perspective of of how we need to be looking at copyright. But I also feel looking back now that not everybody got it that quickly. And there was still a bit of a reticence to take on board what the court had said. And, and some who had sought to characterize, for example, the user rights language as mere obiter. It wasn't really what the court was talking about. How did, how did you see that that response playing out? Um, <clears throat> well, quite frankly, I, I, I think I agreed with some of the skeptics that uh, apart from the fair dealing right to characterize the uh, the co uh, copyrights as a balancing of rights with users having, I mean, it's almost, their rights are almost put on par with copyright owners. Frankly, I thought that went a little far. And, uh, and, and my feeling was that that was probably obiter. Uh, it was farther than the court needed to go to decide the uh, uh, users' rates under the uh, fair dealing section. So, so it did surprise me uh, that users' rights became such a prominent part of the uh, subsequent interpretation uh, of that decision. Okay, that's inter that, that's interesting because certainly, if we would now with that benefit of hindsight and look back, obviously to the Pentology from two thousand and twelve five copyright decisions, more recently the Access Copyright in York decision, and, and really every fair dealing case that we've had ever since. That notion of user rights in the CCH decision has played a cornerstone role in the foundational role um, in many of those outcomes. Yeah. You know, the only surprise I have there is that, and I, I hate to put it this way, but the publishers after that Law Society decision continued to flog the issue of the availability of a license 
as somehow affecting or negating the fair dealing rate. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, frankly, I would have thought that the case was pretty clear apart from users' rights. The fact that fair dealing was not affected by the availability of a license uh, would have uh, come home to them. And, uh, and, but, you know, you can see how they, uh, thought there might be a narrow avenue to distinguish the uh, CCH case in the sense that if you limit it to its special facts, where the, you know, that we're all about uh, public policy and access to the law uh, as being the overriding factor for deciding the case, then, you know, they, they probably felt justified in pursuing uh, that narrow avenue of uh, of uh, lace, uh, the existence of or availability of a license as somehow tempering uh, the scope of fair dealing rights, um, and so that. But you know, <laughs> the subsequent cases that you speak of, the pentology, uh, made it pretty clear that the existence of a license has no bearing on the user's rights under fair dealing. Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely right, of course. And, you know, I, I wanted to, to conclude with this because uh, and and this issue of licensing, because the, despite the influence of the CCH case and the follow on cases, you know, there I, I think it's fair to say that fair dealing remains under some amount of attack. And uh, certainly there are there are many that are still or some that are still arguing for amendments that effectively amount to fair dealing, not applying if a license is available, particularly they would say in an educational context. Now, again, I, I, in re rereading the transcript, it feels like you anticipated this because in your reply, you noted several times that a license as a, as a substitute effectively gave the publishers the right to regulate fair dealing was the specific language you used. I think you, you repeated that notion of a right to regulate fair dealing three times. Uh, can you talk a bit more about, you know, what you meant and, you know, the, the fact that this is an issue that, that still persists today? Once you recognize uh, fair dealing as a right under the act, then the existence or non-existence of a license has no effect on that. The court interpreted the uh, fair dealing right as not as an exception to infringement, but as a right to be balanced with the rights of the, uh, of the owners of the copyright. So, so it, uh, I think their argument had been, well, how could it be fair if a license on acceptable terms is available to you? Of course, that's when you get into um, uh, regulating fair dealing, because uh, you know it's one thing to make a license available; it's another thing uh, to get into the terms of the license. Uh, the license can control what's copied, how much is copied, uh, how many copies are made, and essentially how the the copy is used. So, I mean that it was the the the, the fear of that I think that caught the court's attention uh, to uh, allowing the publishers to essentially regulate uh, fair dealing, which they recognize to be a public right. So a very important issue. And I think now the publishers, after the Pentology and, and other cases, I think the publishers have realized that, uh, that a license will not solve their problems. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think you've seen that there are attempts to amend the legislation to, to uh, create that, uh, that uh uh, criteria for determining fair dealing on whether or not a license is available. Yeah, no, that we continue to see that play out. And so, you know, CCH had, of course, this this dramatic impact on how we conceive of copyright. And uh, there's been, for the better part of the last couple of decades, certainly some that have remained unhappy with with that that change. The composition of the court has changed. We've gone through major copyright reform along the way. And so despite sort of some of the frustration that I think some have with where the law is at. It is so firmly ensconced. And, you know, on this 20th anniversary, it, it, the, the impact is, is difficult to overstate. And quite clearly through, through this discussion, 
your impact on sort of the strategic decisions that were made and the argument itself obviously had a huge amount of uh, of impact on what that outcome would look like. So so thank you for the, all that work that you did. And, and thank you so much for joining me on the podcast to, to take a look back at at the unfolding of, of CCH before the court. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I've enjoyed this very much. And thank you for your, your compliments. Uh, I'm sure that any other good IP lawyer would have uh, ensured the same result if they had the case that I did. Okay. Thanks very much, Scott. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at lawbitespod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.